John grew up in a Christian family. He was actively involved in the church during his teenage years, but then when he entered into university, he became increasingly unhappy with his church and actually quite irritated over, oh, the way the church did things. It wasn't over the substance stuff, it was over style. But instead of talking to another believer or to the pastor about it or whatever, instead, he began to slowly distance himself from the church, and he stopped going to the small groups. He stopped going to Sunday church as often. It became less and less, and he distanced himself from the fellowship of the church and from the shepherding care of the pastors. And during this time, John encountered a numerous challenges and temptations, as is really quite common in university life. And he began to drift further away from walking faithfully with Christ. And he ended up making a number of foolish decisions and choices. He uh, started to get into the party scene, started to drink too much, experimented with drugs, and he got into this toxic relationship, which only further fueled his downward spiral. John's life was spinning out of control, and he began to find himself despairing and feeling hopeless, isolated, lost. He has severed himself from the, the support and accountability of a church fellowship and the spiritual oversight of pastoral care and shepherding care of his elders. Well, it was only really after he experienced a a number of painful consequences and hitting rock bottom that he finally realized how important it is for him to be vitally connected to a church fellowship and under the shepherding care of pastors. So he returned and he found the love and the support that he needed, the guidance from spiritual leaders that he needed to find healing, restoration, and a renewed faith. Now that's the story of John, but you know what? Sometimes the story doesn't end so well. You see, do you know people like John? Have you met someone like John? Are you like John? Christians that become sort of disgruntled with the church over really trivial things, and they become disconnected, but they're never better off for it especially in a culture where it's tough to be a Christian and stand for Christ and withstand the temptations that are increasingly all around us and in front of us. You see, Christ saves us and unites us spiritually to Himself, but He also unites us spiritually to His church, His body. And it's in the local church under the shepherding care of Christ under shepherds that we are meant to be for our good, for our guarding, for our growth, even with all the imperfections and flaws that are to be expected in a church. We're not finished yet. We're works in progress. But this is why, as the Apostle Peter is now bringing his letter to a a climax and and a close, he has these final exhortations that really are key commitments that he's called us to. One that we saw last time we were in 1 Peter, yonks ago, which were the key personal commitments to stand firm. Today and next time we're in 1 Peter, we see the key church commitments we are to have. Follow along as I read verses 1 to 7 of chapter 5. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, overseeing not under compulsion, but willingly according to God, and not for dishonest gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. 
you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. These are in here three key church commitments that He he gives us. One for the leaders, one for the congregation, and a third for both the leaders and the congregation. But you see that very first word of verse 1 there, therefore, that connects it to the same context as the previous section that we were in, a portion that we were in way back, you know, over a month and a half ago before I went to the States, chapter 4, verses 12 to 13. And if you can recall what that was all about, that was in the context of what to do when you are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. What to do when you are suffering as a Christian, when God's plan for you is to endure suffering for Christ's sake. In other words, when the culture makes it really, really tough to be a Christian. You know, I guess, like our culture. (laughs) We need the church in the best of times, but we'd be fools to assume that we can spiritually flourish in a cultural context like ours without a commitment to a local church and being under the shepherding care of biblical elders. So to that end, we're going to begin working our way through these three key church commitments. We're going to begin today with just looking at the first one for leaders. This is where Peter spends most of his time, most ink on the spiritual leaders of the church, because the local church rises or falls with its leadership. That's where he begins, that's where we will begin, and this is what we'll spend our time with. The remaining we'll cover next time. Follow along as I read again, verses 1 to 4. Here, this is the first key commitment for the church leaders. Therefore, I exhort. Now, follow along. You're following along? Who is he exhorting here? Therefore, I exhort who? The elders. Note that. Among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. And what is the command of verse 2? Shepherd. So you can say it better than that. Come on. Shepherd, that's the main thing here. Shepherd the flock of God among you, overseeing, not under compulsion, but willingly according to God and not for dishonest gain, but with eagerness, nor as yet lording it over those allotted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Let's look at, first of all, who this key commitment is for. Very clear, right? I exhort the elders. Now, you got to remember here, though, this is probably more important than you might think. He's writing to all the churches in Asia Minor. That's pretty much modern-day Turkey, all right? There's a lot of churches there. And yet, Peter is addressing the highest level of leadership at each of those local churches. And what is the office that has the highest level of local church leadership in each and every one of those churches? The what? Elders. The elders, right? Elders. In other words, let me put it like this. These churches weren't pastor-led. These churches weren't congregation-led. These churches weren't bishop-led or synod left are led or regional or nationally led. These elders were among them, among the sheep. They were elders. What are elders? We've covered this before, so we're not going to go into a big old study on that, but let me sum it up for you. Basically, elders are a plurality of God-ordained, God raises them up, Biblically qualified, they have to meet the stringent biblical qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, who jointly shepherd a local body of believers. There you go. Plurality of God-ordained, biblically qualified men who jointly shepherd a local body of believers. Those are elders. And listen, that is the only pattern for church leadership in the New Testament elders. 
And that's what we practice here. Oh, but Tony, why then are you sometimes called pastor? Well, that's just customary. Um, but it's not too far off the mark because you know what pastor means? Shepherd. And look at verse 2. What are elders to do? Shepherd. In fact, the Bible also refers to elders as overseers. And notice what elders are to do. They are to be overseeing, verse 2. So look, pastors, overseers, leaders, different names, different uh, descriptions, but the same office. It's not different levels of authority or separate offices, the same office. Just highlighting different aspects of the one role, the one office, eldership. Oh, but Tony, I thought you were the senior pastor of, of this church. Actually, there's only one senior pastor, and he's mentioned in verse 4. The chief shepherd, chief meaning senior, pastor meaning shepherd, chief shepherd, or shepherd meaning pastor. He's the, he's the senior pastor. And I get it. You know, I know there are some churches that use the term, a title, a senior pastor in more conventional ways uh, just to refer to their staff pastor or their leading pastor or something like that. But technically speaking, there's only one senior pastor, Jesus Christ. And he's the senior pastor of Fenton Park Bible Church. Well, then, Tony, what do you do, <laughs> right? <laughs> Who are you? Hey, look, I'm just one of the elders that's been freed up financially to devote full time to the task of eldering. That's pretty much it. And I find great joy and safety in eldering in conjunction with the other elders here. Where I'm weak, they're strong, and vice versa, and together we're the stronger for it. Praise the Lord. So the key commitment is for elders. But don't switch off now. Say, well, I'm not an elder. I don't ever plan to be an elder. Well, listen, these principles will still apply because we're talking about here basically about spiritual leadership, spiritual leadership. And whether you're a guy or a gal, you can apply them in whatever capacity of spiritual leadership you may have. Fathers, as you lead your family, mothers, as you parent your children, Disciplers as you seek to influence others. Whatever level or degree of spiritual leadership, you're going to get some principles for your spiritual leadership. Because really, in the end, aren't we all to be disciplers? The Great Commission, right? Go make disciples of all the nations, teaching them, uh, baptizing them, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, right? We're all to be discipling in some way, and not necessarily in a formal way. It could be. But we are to be pouring into others and others pouring into us and growing together. But, of course, this, these principles of spiritual leadership it really is only for those who are followers of Christ. And that's step number one. If this morning you, you aren't following Jesus, I would just urge you to Really consider where you're at with God. There is, a, there is a God. He's a holy God. And if we were to die today in our sinful state, none of us would ever pass His bar of judgment. We would end up in an eternal hell separated from God. That's what we deserve. We deserve God's holy justice against our sin. But praise God, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, took on human flesh, lived a life without sin and perfect obedience, and then paid the penalty for sin on the cross, rose from the dead, offers eternal life and forgiveness to all who trust and believe in Him. And when we follow Him, not only does He give us new life and forgiveness, but He gives us a, a life to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. We get to be part of what Christ is doing in this world, which is a joy, but it begins with following Christ. Well, what then this, this key commitment for elders slash spiritual leaders. It is found in the one solitary command of this of verses 1 to 4. There in verse 2, you said it out loud, it was shepherd, right? Shepherd the flock of God. That's it. That's the key commitment. That's what every spiritual leader must have and must do. And you know what? That's a brilliant word. It's a brilliant concept and principle. It is truly key if you think about it, because what do shepherds do? Well, they lead the sheep. They feed the sheep. They guard the sheep from danger. They care for the sheep, and they train up other shepherds. Lead, feed, guard, 
care, and train. Think about it. Sheep are notorious for being prone to wander. They'll go away and get lost. They'll lose their orientation. So sheep do best when they're led by a wise shepherd. Think also of how sheep are undiscerning about what they eat. Did you know that? They, they can't tell the difference between healthy and toxic plants. They'll just eat both. And so they, they'll feed better when the shepherd brings them to healthy green pastures. Also, sheep are almost entirely defenseless, right, and, and are easily led astray. I mean, they'll follow a Judas sheep right to the slaughter. And uh, without the protect, protective rod and staff of a shepherd and their watchful eye, a sheep are far more vulnerable. Also, sheep have a limited capacity to clean and groom themselves. And this will lead to them getting dirty and infections that come as a result. And, you know, their dags can uh, attract flies and then breeds maggots, and that's not good. Their wool can get so heavy if they're one of those, most sheep don't shed. Some do, but those that don't, they can get so heavy with their wool that if they fall, they can't get up, you know? They need the a kind shepherd to, to drench them, to dip them, to shear them, and at times carry them when they need that until they're able to walk. And shepherding is an acquired skill, is it not? It's not something you can learn simply by reading books, right? It requires applied knowledge. It requires practical wisdom, experience. So it takes a shepherd to train up shepherds. And so you have those five major functions of a shepherd, lead, feed, guard, care, and train. That's exactly what Scripture calls elders to be and to do. And uh, there are many passages on this, but I'm going to be as really quick as possible. Put them on the screen. I just want you to see this, all right? This is not my word. This is God's word when I say those are the five major functions. For example, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 says this, but we ask you, brothers, that you know in a close, personal way, those who labor among you, he's talking about the elders here, and lead you in the Lord and admonish you. There's the leading and the feeding role of elders. They lead you in the Lord. They admonish you. Elders are to lead the church in the Lord. They lead the church in direction and doctrine, doctrine and direction, of course, always and only according to God's Word. Same thing for spiritual leaders. Fathers, parents, whatever, we are to lead, you are to lead by God's Word, not just your own, not your own Word. God's Word is the ultimate authority. God sets the direction in your family. Elders are also to feed the church. They admonish you, and in fact, that's a stronger word, that's a corrective word. Part of the teaching is not just instruction, but also correction. They do it by sound doctrine, not just teaching facts, but truth applied to life and backed up by a godly example. That's how you lead spiritually. That's how you feed spiritually. Are you able to help others think biblically? Think biblically? I'm sure we're all, a lot of Christians are well-meaning, and they want to encourage and build up others. And sometimes we all we have these trite little sayings, but can we actually help people think biblically? Can you help your children think biblically? And when you do, can you say, do as I do? Or do you kind of say, do as I say, not as I do? We've got to lead by example. We've got to lead and feed. Hebrews 13, 17 says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, again, talking about elders, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Now, that's the guarding role of elders, guarding the church from false teaching and sinful behavior. And same thing with spiritual leaders, same thing with fathers, same thing with parents. Are you able to guard those you lead by discerning between sound and unsound doctrine and teaching. 
Are you able to discern between what is wise and unwise, what is liberty according to Scripture, and what is license? What is God's will and what's yours? Can you discern that and help others discern that, guarding them from unwise decisions? And 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, this is in the context of the qualifications for elders. It says this, but if a man does not know how to lead his own household... How will he take care of the church of God? That's the caring role of elders, to care for those who are especially spiritually weak. And if you're a spiritual leader, what does that look like? That means coming along people that are struggling, that are weak. Your kids, when they're weak and struggling, and often we get impatient, right? Often we, we, uh, we're put out by how inconvenienced we are by their struggling and their emotionalism or whatever, you know. They lost the plot. They need help. We want to say just, you know, harden up, take a concrete pill. But we are to take care of them. And 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 says this, And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, this is Paul to Timothy, and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's the training role of elders. We got to train up future elders. If we don't do that, what's going to happen? Next generation, there won't be biblically qualified, godly leaders of a church. Faithful biblical ministry must carry on and the baton must be passed. So same thing with spiritual leadership. You should always be thinking about replacing yourself. Always thinking about passing on what you know, what you, how you've grown, not just informing, but seeking th- that their lives would be transformed in godly living. And look, if you were to look up all the other relevant passages, and there are many, you would find that there are these five and only five major functions of an elder slash shepherd slash spiritual leader, which actually, if you think about it, is quite instructive in what the role of pastor, elder, overseer does not entail, if we had time. Uh, We could talk about how the role does not involve, for example, enlarging the flock. Do you realize that? It's not the job of the elders to put on a show to get a crowd, right? It's not our job to do all the evangelism. Healthy sheep beget healthy sheep. We're all to be witnesses, if we had time. We could also talk about how the pastoral role does not involve doing all the work of the ministry, all the visitations, all the reaching out to those on the fringe or those going astray, all the counseling, all the support, care, and encouragement. No, no. We are to gather as sheep, flocking together to get equipped for the work of ministry so that we support one another. Yeah, the shepherds lead by example in those areas, but they are to be equipping and assisting the sheep to do it. And on we could go, you know, if we had time. But to shepherd really is the key. You remember that time, um, that time after Peter denied the Lord three times? There he was on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and... Christ shows up on the scene, and Christ is restoring him, restoring Peter back to the Lord and back to the ministry. And what did uh, did Jesus say to Peter? He said, do you love me, right, three times? And Peter affirmed his love. And then when Jesus was restoring Peter to the ministry, how did Christ sum up Peter's responsibility? Oh, you love me, Peter? He says, shepherd my sheep, tend my sheep. My sheep, it's a similar word. Shepherd, it's the key commitment. So if you're an elder, if you aspire to be an elder, if you're a spiritual leader in the home or at church, Christ wants you to shepherd his sheep. But you know what else that means? If God wants elders to shepherd, then he wants the congregation to be shepherded. Think about that. God wants elders to shepherd, and He wants you to be shepherded. Oh, no thanks, Tony. 
I'm God's sheep. I'll do just fine. Well, you know what? You're absolutely right. If you've been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, that's true. Because look at verse 2. The congregation is called what? The flock of God. And every elder must never forget that the sheep are not the elder's sheep to do with the sheep as the elders want. No, they are God's sheep that, the sh- that they are to be shepherd, shepherded as Christ wants. And, and he holds elders accountable for it. But having said that, notice verse 3. Look down at verse 3 where he says, and describes the congregation as sheep who were what? Allotted to the elders by God. Oh, but wait a minute, Tony. I'm shepherded by Christ. Amen. If you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul, as chapter 2, verse 25 says, then he is your chief shepherd. And guess what? Your chief shepherd has also allotted you to the shepherding care of elders. But wait a minute. Elders are just sheep like me. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. 1 Peter 2, 9 says that we're all holy priesthood, so I can take care of myself. Thank you very much. And yes, elders are not more important than the congregation. We're all spiritual equals. Elders simply have a different function. And don't forget, elders must meet a stringent list of qualifications, and they must give an account for their ministry. Don't forget that. But let's really get to the rub here. Because really, what's behind the spirit of all that? I think it's this. It's a heart that says, I don't want to be under any spiritual leadership or held to account for my beliefs or my behavior by any other than God. And you know what? God is the only one that you and I are ultimately accountable to, right? And when you stand before him, he will hold you accountable for how submissive, how supportive, how appreciative, and how respectful you were to his under-shepherds that the Holy Spirit made overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Now, I know that there are some pastors out there that um, shouldn't be because they are biblically unqualified. And I'm sure there are elderships out there that aren't shepherding as biblically consistent or faithfully as they should. I mean, look, we haven't arrived. We're under no uh, uh, deception that we have somehow arrived. But listen, if you're expecting an eldership to be flawless before you'll agree to be shepherded by them then you're expecting more than Christ does. So yeah, choose wisely. Choose your church wisely. Choose the, uh, the church with its eldership that you're going to be under wisely. But once you do, be the most submissive, supportive, appreciative, respectful member that you could be. Look, don't just come in and, and go out of their radar. Don't be on the fringe. Don't be that sheep that's reluctant to follow, always needed to be prodded to do something. And don't resent it when the shepherd brings out his crook and pulls you in to keep you from sin and error. It's for your good. As much as is biblically possible, follow their lead. Take in what they feed you. You know, let them guard you. Accept their care. Take up the training opportunities. Amen? Amen. Now, I know that was a big point, but it was Peter's, it is Peter's main concern here. Everything else that he says in these verses, verses 1 to 4, is meant to drive home that key idea, that key commitment of shepherding. What he says before it is intended to inspire us to shepherd, and what happens after is to tell us how. So let's look at what comes before, verse 1, where we find where to find inspiration to fulfill this key commitment to shepherd, and it's found in Christ. Because let's face it, let's face it, shepherding is a tough job. It's a tough job, all right? Long hours, hard work, tireless demands, a lot of mental strain, and sobering divine accountability. At times, it's thankless. Oftentimes, it's messy because sheep are dirty and stinky. Don't take that personally. (laughs) 
Sheep can also be stubborn and headbutt you. So shepherds, elders, parents, disciples need inspiration and motivation to shepherd. And that's why he says what he says in verse 1. Follow along as I read. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Now, I love what Peter is doing here because not only does he give us motivation to shepherd, he gives us a model of a shepherd. Remember, Peter is an apostle, right? He was proven by divine miracles, right? That he was, in fact, an eyewitness of Christ's resurrection, directly chosen by Christ to speak for Christ. I mean, he was a capital A, no kidding around, apostle. All he would need to say is, therefore, shepherd the flock of God. As an apostle, his command is as good as Christ's command. Enough said. But instead, he, instead of saying, you know, just giving a command, shepherd, he says, I exhort. Now, in the original, this is a gentler form of appeal. It has the sense of to call alongside, to call alongside. In other words, it's like saying this, come along with me as I do what I'm asking you to do. He doesn't just make orders from an ivory tower. He doesn't make orders from an armchair, but from the sheep pen smelling like sheep. That's exemplary leadership. And instead of saying, I exhort and as an apostle of Jesus Christ, which he could do, instead he says, I exhort as your fellow elder. Now, you see, the role of an apostle was very similar to that of an elder, to lead, feed, guard, care, and train. Same thing, except an apostle did it multi-church-wide. And, of course, the, they got direct divine revelation. Don't forget that. But essentially the same basic functions. So it is true that while he is an apostle, he is also a fellow elder. But instead of appealing to them as an, an apostle, he addresses the elders as one of them, as one who shoulders the same commitments and difficulties as them. That's humble, gracious leadership. And, and instead of, I, I feel I'm, I, if I just move, something's happening. Is it, is it the base down here? That good? Yeah, yeah, the twisted thing. Yeah. Or is it up here? <laughs> I think we're good. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so instead of trying to like put oomph behind the authority of his exhortation, he puts oomph behind what motivates us to carry out the task of shepherding by focusing on Christ and his suffering and his second coming. He says he was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. What does he mean there? Well, he's been talking about it over and over again in this epistle, how he has focused on how Christ suffered in a God-glorifying way in the sense that he was so committed, Christ was so committed to doing God's will that he was willing to suffer in doing it. Peter remembers that time in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was in agony, and in agony he accepted that cup, and he said, Father, if this this cup can pass from me, let it be so, but if not, not my will, but your will be done. The cup of the full wrath of God taking upon himself in our place. Ah, Peter remembers also how when they came to arrest Jesus, how he stood fearlessly, didn't fight back, but accepted his arrest. And then in his trial, even when he was abused, he did not retaliate. He didn't revile in return. This is what he's talking about. And shepherding brings suffering. We need a model of how to do it right. 
He also says he's a partaker, he was a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. In other words, Peter got a preview of Christ's second coming glory. When? You remember? Mount of Transfiguration? Peter, James, and John at the, at the top of the mount. Jesus was, was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. Have you ever looked at, straight into the sun? That's how bright his face became. And then his clothes, it says, shone intensely white like lightning. Peter witnessed that. Peter can testify that Christ is, in fact, the Lord of glory and that he's coming back again in glory. It's real. And notice he says that this second coming glory is about to be revealed. That's the better translation. It's about to be revealed. It's imminent. It's real. It's imminent. It's sure. And therefore, it's worth it. What motivated Peter is what will motivate elders and will motivate you and I. You. Yes, shepherding, when you shepherd people, you're going to get some pushback. There's going to be some suffering. People are going to misunderstand. People are going to mistreat you. You're going to resent what you're trying to do. That's par for the course. Look to Christ. Because Christ's suffering sanctified suffering. He dignified suffering. He showed us that there's triumph in suffering because after the cross comes the crown. And when shepherding is tough, you look to Christ. And you keep looking to him until you can accept the cup from the Father's hand and say, not my will, but your will be done. And when your endurance, your patience in shepherding your kids... Shepherding difficult people, when that begins to weaken, look to Christ. Jesus said, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to his work. He's coming. He's coming again soon, and his reward is with us. So with our eyes on Christ and our hearts hopefully revved up to carry out this task of shepherding the flock of God, The next question is, great, how do I do it? How do I do it? Well, he answers that, verses 2 and 3, the how of this key commitment. He says, overseeing, that's one, not under compulsion, but willingly, according to God, that's two, and not for dishonest gain, but with eagerness, that's three, and nor yet as lording it over those who allotted to you, but being examples to the flock. Four ways how to shepherd. First is this, by overseeing the spiritual health, safety, and flourishing of the flock, God's flock. Uh, That word oversee is a word that comes with a word picture. It has the word picture of the watchful eye of a shepherd, the watchful eye of a shepherd. What is he doing? He's looking and seeking the health, safety, and flourishing of the flock. That's spiritual leadership. That's overseeing. But, of course, if you're going to do that, you've got to know what is spiritually healthy for the flock, right? And you need to lead them to it and feed them with it. Also, you're going to need to know what is spiritually dangerous for the flock so that you can guard them from it. And you need to know the symptoms of spiritual diseases and their cures so that you can look out for those symptoms and apply the cure. That's spiritual leadership. So fathers, mothers, disciples, future elders, current elders, are we leading and feeding in what is spiritually healthy to those that you might be shepherding? Are you guarding them from what is spiritually dangerous? Are you looking out for the symptoms of spiritual sickness? And can you apply biblical counsel to it? You say, wow, that's pretty tough. I think I need some help. Well, if you feel you need equipping, women, come along to Titus 2 women. Those are the very themes that Chantel chooses books on, you know, often. Men, come along to the men's breakfast. We're talking about how to be men of the word there. Discuss it at home group. That's what they're there for. Be connected to a home group. And you know what? We want to provide courses for you to equip you further. We just got to figure out a time that works because it's really tricky. 
but we could be praying about that. So overseeing involves those things. And then following that, he gives us three not this but that kind of statements, and it tells us what's wrong and right and overseeing. And this is important. You know, like um, sometimes my wife, my beloved wife will tell me, honey, it's not what you said, but what? How you said it, right? (laughs) And it's the same thing with shepherding. It's not just in what you do, it's also in how you do it. And you know what? Many a potential elder fail at this very point. These not this, but that statements that we're about to look at. If a guy like that is brought into eldership, he could destroy the leadership team and the church along with it. That's how important these next not this, but that are. So let's listen up. Let's look then at the second way is this. We shepherd by an inner drive to do it for God, not an outer drive. He says, not under compulsion, but willingly according to God. Under compulsion is an outer drive. That's others. That's someone else, maybe his wife, maybe some other person in the church that is putting pressure on this person to step up into leadership. That's under compulsion. You don't want that. Or if it's a current elder on the elder uh, team, it could be a guy who is that one elder that all the other elders need to keep putting feet to the fire because the guy won't step up to share the load. It happens. It doesn't happen here, praise the Lord. We've got a great eldership team, and we're jealously holding on to that because it's such a joy to serve together. But you get someone that, that is only serving under compulsion, you got some problems. God doesn't want reluctant, lazy, indifferent shepherds shepherding his sheep. He wants shepherds, he wants elders, he wants husbands, parents, disciples who shepherd with an inner drive, willingly according to God. Willingly means voluntarily. You don't have to be forced to do it. But, and according to God, well, that's an interesting little phrase. Uh, it's a little bit tricky. It could mean as God wants, but to me that seems redundant. All of this is what God wants. I think the best sense is for God, all right? The, the willingness comes from doing the work for God as opposed to for others. That we do it, we serve others, but we do it for God. We don't do it for the praise or, the, or whatever we might get from others. The ministry is not for those who focus on themselves, but for those who focus on God. In other words, biblical shepherds are not to serve like drafted soldiers, <laughs> but like volunteers who are passionate for the cause, the cause of Christ. The third way shepherding is to be done, there in verse 2, uh, towards the end, by an eagerness for Christ's gain, not personal gain. By an eagerness for Christ's gain, not personal gain. Because he says, and not for dishonest gain, but with eagerness. Now, dishonest gain uh, means an excessive desire for personal gain an excessive desire for personal gain. And that personal gain could be, it might be material, it, it might be social, it might be political. In other words, it might be they want money, they, they want popularity, or they have some personal agenda. That's dishonest gain. This is not speaking about or against pastors getting paid. First Timothy 5, 17, 18, very clearly, the shepherds, the pastors who teach and lead, uh, uh, you know, are worthy of double honor. He means not only respect, but remuneration, pay. Don't muzzle an ox while he treads out the grain. A laborer is worthy of his wages. So, you know, I guess that means I'm an ox. That's okay. But this is speaking against hireling pastors. And there was a, there's been a number of times in church history where there have been churches or denominations that have had offices of pastors that people just sort of joined in like you would, you know, work at McDonald's or work at this or that other job. They, their heart wasn't really in it. They weren't qualified. They're, they weren't driven by the glory of Christ and the eternal weight of the cause of Christ. It's a hireling pastor. This is also speaking against 
so-called pastors with their private jets and mansions and preachers with their multi-thousand dollar sneakers, those don't shepherd the flock, they fleece the flock. This is also speaking against pastors who care more about their image and gaining popularity than they do pleasing God. And there's also speaks against an elder who has a personal agenda and wants to steer, steer the church in that direction, but it's not a truly biblical one. It happens. Instead of an excessive desire for personal gain, a shepherd is to have an excessive desire for Christ's gain, Christ's glory. The cause of Christ being furthered. That's what it's all about. And the fourth and final way that uh, shepherding needs to be done is by exemplary leadership, not bossy leadership. Look at verse 3. Nor yet as lording it over those allotted to you, but by being examples to the flock. You have to keep in mind that in the ancient Middle East, shepherds led the flock from the front. The shepherd went in front and went the direction he wants the sheep to go, and he would call the sheep to follow, and they would follow him. That's exemplary leadership. He goes out before. There's credibility. There's example. In other words, they're not bald men trying to sell hair restorer, right? I'm not selling hair restorer, by the way. But there's another kind of shepherding. And that's one that drives the flock from behind. You have dogs that nip at the the heels, or you have uh, yelling and screaming, or you have pushing or whips or whatever. They drive the flock from behind. That's bossy, lording it over leadership. That's domineering, heavy-handed, manipulative kind of leadership. Pastors are to be overseers, not overlords. Shepherds, not sheriffs. Servants, not slave drivers, and pastors are to be pastors, not little popes. Jesus said it, right? Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. But back in the 1960s and 70s, I don't know uh, if you heard of this, but uh, and there is some of it in uh, New Zealand still. It was called the Shepherding Movement. Shepherding Movement. It emerged. uh, That's what it was called, at least, the Shepherding Movement, but it was more like lording it over movement. You heard of this? What would happen is, and it's taken up in different forms, but what would happen is the church members, when you became a church member, you were given or placed under a, a shepherd or discipler or a home group leader or something like that. They would call them different names. And what you would have to do as a member is you were expected to confess your sin, sins to your discipler, to your leader, your mentor, whatever. You were to report to that person how much you pray how much you read, how much you serve in the church, how much you give. And, and you were to get their approval before making any major decision. Now, as well-meaning as that movement was, and still is, there are still elements of that here and there, that's, that's excessive control. That's lording it over. That's, that's not leading from the front. That's leading with a leash, you know? That's not what it's to be, exemplary leadership. Really, when when we look at all four of these, we can really sum it up by the simple idea of this. To shepherd is to have a pastor's heart, a pastor's heart. He loves the sheep because they're God's sheep. And, and, And in everything he does, he seeks their spiritual good according to God's word, and he does it for God's glory and God's glory alone. And he has a rod of protection, He has a staff of direction, but he uses it not with severity, but in such a way that it brings security and comfort to the sheep, just like the rod and staff of our chief shepherd, right? Your rod and your staff, they what? Comfort me. So we've seen the who, we've seen the what, we've seen the where, we've seen the how, but one final brief point is this, why? Why is this key commitment worth it? Verse 4, it's the eternal reward. Verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Faithful shepherding is worth it because Christ will eternally reward it with an unfading crown of glory. You know, it's interesting there, that word crown, it's not the one made of gold that kings wear, all right? It's the one that was made in the Greek games of leaves and flowers 
that went on the head of the one who won in one of the Greek games. It's the victor's crown. And it was beautiful. It was a garland crown. But as beautiful as it was, as meaningful as it was, it would fade and perish. But there was, and they knew of a flower. It's called the amaranth flower. It's a brightly colored flower. And it was prized for, its, for the fact that it remains vibrant and attractive for a very long time, the amaranth flower. And you know what? That's the word that the, that the, the Greeks took to convey this idea of unfading. The reward that Christ will give faithful shepherds is one that will never lose its beautiful quality. In effect, listen, can you imagine this? You know how like sometimes at a work or whatever, someone might give you a commendation and you go, you know, well done, good job what you did. And, And that's great. And it's encouraging in the time. But then, you know, next week comes and it's all forgotten. This is describing getting a commendation from Christ that it's an eternal commendation. Eternal commendation. Let that sit in. It's worth it. And you know what? Reward day is coming because it comes when the chief shepherd appears. He's talking about the rapture there, the first phase of the second coming of Christ. First there's the rapture. Then we're with the Lord in, the, in, in heaven, in the clouds in the heaven. We get rewarded. Then we return with him to the earth in his second coming glory. So reward day is coming, and it's imminent. It's worth it. Press on. Keep at it. But also, listen, brothers and sisters, never forget that elders, too, have a shepherd. Verse 4, the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. And they, pastors, we elders, keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. A visitor uh, of a church approached a pastor, I'll close with this, and uh, said to the pastor, Wow, it must be really hard to keep all these people happy. Pastor just smiled. He says, I don't even try to keep them happy. I try to please the Lord, and I let him take care of the rest. That's what it is. Because if you're driven by the applause of men or some kind of perks or something, listen, the praise from men is fickle. Whatever perks there may be from pastoring, (laughs) whatever they might be, is fleeting. And any lust for power or earthly popularity is futile. But the praise and prize that comes from Christ is forever glorious. So press on. Wherever capacity of shepherding you are in, press on. It's worth it. Christ is coming, so let's be faithful. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this good, powerful word from the apostle Peter, who got to witness the greatest shepherd of all, you. And Lord, when we look to you and we see how you are a shepherd, and we can say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. You lead us, you guide us into pastures green. You know, you, you protect us, you guard us, you lead us to still waters. You restore our soul. And even though we go through the valley of the shadow of death, you, we will not fear any evil because your rod and staff, they comfort us. You're the perfect shepherd. And Lord, as parents, as fathers, as mothers, as disciples, as elders, Lord, we want a shepherd like you shepherd us. We want to be faithful. We want to represent you well. And Lord, we know that it's worth it because you're coming again and you will reward the efforts that are made, all the suffering that we might undergo, all the pushback, all whatever, the thanklessness, all the hard work will not be forgotten. It may not be seen by any other, but you see it. And that encourages us to press on. So help us to be faithful, Lord. And to do it the way that you've outlined for us, driven for your glory, doing it from a heart that's stirred for your, the, for the, to further your cause, 
where self is not at the center, but Christ is. And Lord, that we would lead by example. So Lord, we pray, help us to be faithful. And God, I pray also for any who might have not yet come to uh, to you through your son. They have not returned to the shepherd, the overseer of their soul. They need a shepherd. They're like sheep without a shepherd. They're lost. And if they continue in that state, they will perish eternally in hell. But you offer the forgiveness of sins, restoration, new life, and a new purpose that is an eternal purpose. Lord, would you, would you draw them to yourself today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.